When I was a student more decades ago than I care to calculate, I was intrigued by a small pamphlet written by a young Nigerian Muslim scholar, Abdurrahman Doi. In it, he challenged traditional Muslim ideas about the status of non-Muslims in Islamic society, namely that of protected and circumscribed minority, the status of Zimmi, calling, in, calling instead for its replacement by a common national citizenship and arguing for it on basic Islamic principles drawn from the revealed text, the Qur'an, and the model uh, set by the Prophet Muhammad, the Sunnah. I'll come back to this argument later, but the point here is that my professor dismissed the discussion as irrelevant, as it didn't harmonize with the Islamic legal tradition constructed over centuries. Of course, in strictly academic terms, he was right, but, his, but by his dismissal, he had taken it upon himself as a non-Muslim Orientalist and a well-known Christian Evangelical at the same time a highly regarded expert in Islamic law, he had taken upon himself to determine what was Islamically legitimate and illegitimate. This term of categorical dismissal of any expression of Islam which does not fit with the observer's preferred perspective is an unfortunate dimension of current debate, something of which both non-Muslims and Muslims can be guilty. On one side of the argument, <clears throat> among non-Muslim observers, is the Islamophobe, and on the other, the Halal Hippie, a delightful term which I haven't yet met outside Denmark, I'm doing my bit to uh, spread it. Behind this phenomenon lies, firstly, the general problem of the nature and role of the, Islamic, of the academic observer of Islam and Muslim society, whether as insider or as outsider. And secondly, how that observer chooses to understand and portray an Islam and the Muslim society which is subject to rapid change. To my mind, the condition of rapid change is an essential dimension that must be taken into account if one is to understand Islam today. On the surface, Islam can be presented in comparatively simple and globally valid terms, but one doesn't have to scratch very far below that surface to discover the theological, philosophical, legal, ideological, and existential complexities which have occupied both Muslim and non-Muslim scholars over centuries, not to mention the ordinary believers in their everyday lives. These complexities are, dy are dynamic. They vary from place to place and from time to time. Islamic thought has never stood still. There is today more than sufficient scholarship that ought to have put an end to the idea that at some time in the early Middle Ages Islamic thought was fossilized. The myth of the closing of the gate of which jihad, or independent reasoning, is precisely that. It's a myth. Regular renewal has been an integral dimension of the intellectual history of Islam, and the Islam which Edward Lane saw expressed in Egypt in the early 19th century bears only a distant relationship to that of today. And it's a long time since the American anthropologist Clifford Goetz pointed to the vast differences between the lived Islam of different parts of the Muslim world. The changes and the variations tend to arise out of necessities driven by political, economic and social circumstances. In the real world, it's seldom that an argument wins solely on the strength of its intellectually persuasive power. It wins because it is one which more closely reverberates with the needs of the audience. And in winning, it in turn impacts on the realities in which individuals and communities live their daily lives. Islamic his history has in this respect been a history of the interaction between realities and ideas. For scholars of religion, not to mention scholars of the history of law, politics, philosophy, science and literature, the idea that their fields are subject to change in this way is integral to their approaches to their fields of study. So to label the point in relation to Islam will be regarded by many as possibly a bit naive or precious, were it not for the many commentators out there who refuse to see other than a fossilized Islam incapable of change. But I want to go a step further. All the many and various ideas and details which have been produced by the endeavors of Muslim intellectuals over the centuries have not disappeared, even when they didn't find much support at the time and therefore were never widely adopted, or when they were adopted and later marginalized as new ideas took 
They continued to exist in storage, so to speak. On the one hand, were the small groups which for various reasons continued to uphold the ideas in question. On the other hand, such ideas remained accessible in the texts of the scholars. Circumstances change. Political, social, economic and cultural environments have moved on. And in the Muslim world that movement has experienced an acceleration of unprecedented magnitude since the 19th century. And as circumstances change, so ideas come under pressure to engage with the new circumstances. Some of the inherited structures have little to offer by way of answers to the new challenges and require amendment, revision or replacement. The search for answers does not function in a vacuum. It looks for help in what already exists, including particularly in the resources which already exist within the tradition. That store of intellectual wealth which has been built up over the centuries, is always potentially relevant. It's no coincidence that there's been an explosion in the work of editing and publishing Islamic, historical, theological, legal and philosophical texts in the last three decades. Of course, this is not a process driven by a single cause. The oil wealth which has accrued to certain countries since the mid-1970s has encouraged and funded much of this. But more important has been the perceived need to explore the responses of the intellectual past, a need which has found expression also in the massive expansion of universities throughout the Muslim world, an expansion when in, which in turn has established a market for these editions of ancient texts. In the following, and I intend to illustrate my point of reference first to some elements in the current global Islamic debate and then to the particular situation of Islam in Europe. <coughs> Firstly and briefly, I'd refer to some of the fundamental argumentation which has taken place for some generations now about the use of the core, core sources of Islam, particularly the Quran and the Prophet's exemplary sayings and actions, the Sunnah, and the methods of their interpretation in relation to the law. In the 9th to 10th centuries of the Common Era, a major theological and philosophical struggle within the majority Sunni trend of Islam was resolved with the confirmation of the primary function of the Sunnah as religious authority, recorded in the anecdotal form of Hadith. Although this primacy was accepted by all the Sunni schools of law, the disciples of the 9th century scholar of Hadith, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and his successors of the Hanbali law school became the epitome of the trend. In the early 14th century, the Syrian Hanbali scholar Taqi bin Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah gained notoriety and made a serious nuisance of himself in relation to the Mamluk authorities in Damascus and Cairo for his hardline Hadith-based views. He died in 1328 in prison in Cairo's citadel. His fortunes in historical memory were variable, but he came into his own when Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his intellectual successors raised the teachings of Ibn Taymiyyah to the highest authoritative status in what in the 1920s he has since, in many quarters, come to be regarded as providing the foundations of 20th century so-called fundamentalist Islamic trends. A couple of generations later, a Spanish Muslim scholar, Abu Ishaq Ibrahim Shatibi, he died 60 years after in Tamiya, promoted a rather different approach to the foundations of the law. He stressed concepts of common welfare, Muslim, as a key tool for interpretation of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And in that connection, the concept of the basic objectives, the maqasid of the Sharia, of which the five fundamental ones were the preservation of faith, life, family, intellect and property. Later generations regarded such an approach as providing principles for flexibility within the Islamic law, allowing the details of the law to be adapted to take account of varying circumstances so as to maintain the basic objectives of the law. Outside his own West Mediterranean Maliki Law School, Ashrafabi had little impact until his ideas were revived in the 20th century, especially by the Tunisian Ibn Ashur and the Lebanese Rashid Reda. An indication of the perceived relative importance of Ibn Taymiyyah is the space given to, <coughs> given to him 
In the second edition of the Encyclopedia of Islam, the work collated in alphabetical order over a 40-year period and completed only at the beginning of the current century. Ibn Taymiyyah gets over 4,000 words. The Shatabi, less than one-fifth of that. Today, it's inconceivable that the Shatabi will be thus minimized in the recently commenced third edition of the Encyclopedia. Knut Vikur's recent study of the history of Islamic law gives the Shatabi five references to Ibn Taymiyyah's one. The Shatabi has become a central reference for contemporary Muslim thinkers seeking ways of aligning Islamic law and ethics with the requirements of today's world, in particular by many of those intellectuals seeking to find ways of being Muslim in the Western minority situation. For the well-known but in some courses controversial Swiss Muslim thinker Tariq Ramadan, the concept of maslaha, the common welfare, is a central dimension of scriptural interpretation. Together with Naqasid, it has a significant place in both of his best-known books, and he has moved closer towards this approach in recent years if one just takes as a crude measure his references to these two iconic figures. In 1999, Ibn Taymiyyah and the Shatabi get approximately the same number of references, while four years later the Shatabi has a clear lead. In his most recent book, Radical Reform, Ramadan goes even further. In his summary of the classical jurisprudence, the Sul al Fiqh, he identifies three approaches, the deductive of the Shafi, the inductive of the Hanafis, and the school of Maqasid, starting with the Juwaini, who died in 1085, and culminating in the Shafi. Along the way, Ibn Taymiyyah now only gets four references. In the process, both these medieval authorities have surely been subjected to a degree of interpretation, if not mythologization by the many people who refer to them today. I suspect that both would be surprised at how they have been used by their modern followers to legitimize new directions. Secondly, in a bit more detail, I'd refer to the profile of the so-called Constitution of Medina, also called the Pact of Medina. This is a text which appears in the sources comparatively early on, and is stated to be that of a document agreed between Muhammad and the, independent, and the inhabitants of soon after the Prophet's migration there from Mecca in 622 of the Common Era. The full version of the document as we know it today is to be found in the biography of the Prophet Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq, who died in 767. In other words, well over 100 years after the death of the Prophet. His text is the main one referred to, in, uh, referred to by later sources, including the universal history of a poverty. <laughs> There has been some discussion about the authenticity of the text, and most scholars have tended to, be, to the view that it is probably a composite of up to eight different original texts. <clears throat> the origins are not essential to the discussion here, though. The point is the role played by the document in later Islamic thinking. The document has been presented as having established the community under God and his prophet, the Ummah, as a political entity. The document starts, and I quote, this is a document from the Prophet Muhammad between the believers and Muslims of the, of the Quraysh and of Yathrib, Medina, and those who followed them. They are one Ummah to the exclusion of all men in the world. Many historians have suggested that this signifies the point at which the rival tribes of the Arabian Peninsula were subsumed into the new higher inclusive entity, which was the precondition for the unification of energies which were channeled into the Arab conquests in the following decades. For a document which one would expect to be absolutely crucial to later Islamic political thinking, it was surprisingly marginal for centuries. As an example, one of the most important medieval texts of Islamic thinking about government, namely the rules of government, al Hakam Sultaniya of al who died in 1058, and which was subsequently widely used as an authority on the subject, shows no interest in the Medina document. It certainly plays no role in his extensive discussion on the Imam Caliph, which underpins the authority of his whole theory. Likewise, Ibn Khaldun, in his well-known philosophy of history, al Muqaddimah, seems not to know what to do with the Medina document among contemporary Western historians, 
is indicative that such widely used historical syntheses as those of Philip Kempty and more recently Albert Harani also do not mention the document. The interest in the document and its contents changed remarkably in the modern period. Two aspects of its contents are emphasized in a way which has little precedent in the tradition. The unification of the tribes into one Ummah is now seen in the context of that part of the text which lists each of the tribes of Medina and against each states the nature of the commitment to the Ummah, repeatedly using the same formulaic wording. This dimension is mobilized in the modern discussions among Muslim thinkers regarding the role of the nation state. With varying degrees of strength, Many Muslims saw the introduction from Europe of ideas of nation during the 19th century as something alien to Islam. Against it, some argued that the Muslim Ummah was the prototype of a nation. If the Muslim world should integrate the concept of nation, they said, it should be in the form of a unified nation state encompassing all the Muslim lands. This view was mobilized by the Ottomans in their revival of the traditional title of Caliph in the late 18th century in defense against Russian and British encroachment, and it was encouraged by the British when they saw the Arabs have fought against the Ottomans during the First World War. On the other hand, many political thinkers thought it made more sense to draw a parallel between the tribes of the Medina document and the modern nation states of the Muslim world. The tribes were not abolished, but retained their own identity. They were confederated into a higher entity. The parallel with the nation state of today is not distant. Perhaps even more innovatively, modern thinkers have chosen to read the document as including non-Muslims. The Jewish and pagan clans of the Medina over which Muhammad was gradually asserting his authority. This idea that the Islamic Ummah was in its origins multi-religious is a radical reinterpretation of the document. Historically, the pagan component had gradually been excluded, mainly by conversion, while the Jewish component had been excluded by expulsion and, in one instance, by mass execution. In its place, the concept of protected communities, dhimma, had come into use, by which particularly Christians and Jews were integrated in society as protected but circumscribed communities. In classical political legal thought, this change was regarded as having superseded the provisions of the Medina document and established a new precedent. This is one of the reasons why the Medina document quickly lost its centrality as a foundational text for the theory. Modernists tend rather to take the view that the historical developments may have created new circumstances and with them different arrangements, but this does not abolish the principles enunciated in the founding texts. The Egyptian writer Fahmi Hawaii, who is widely regarded as associated with the moderate wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, argued in the 1980s that the Dhimma status was historically contingent but has now been superseded by the common citizenship of Muslims and Copts acquired through their shared struggle for independence from the colonial powers. But about the same time, another intellectual with similar sympathies, Muhammad Salim al Awa, discusses the Medina document in some detail. The document establishes the Muslim Ummah, but it is one which includes, he says, the Jews, and according to some versions, the pagans of Medina as well, while preserving their full religious rights. He provides a religious justification for the time boundedness of the Dhimma, for which Uwaini has provided historical justification. And Awa describes the Dhimma as a contract which can be put aside, not as an eternally normative state of affairs. Not long after, the argument is picked up by the Tunisian Islamist leader. Rashid Ranushi, now in exile in London. The Medina document, he says, lays the foundation of a shared citizenship of the residents of Medina, regardless of their religions. They are all one Ummah, distinct from others. But what's this to do with the topic in my lecture? My point is that Islam, like all substantial religions and, and or intellectual traditions, has accumulated a rich resource of ideas in the vast treasury of texts not to mention in the lived traditions and communities in various parts of the world. Some of these resources are those which lost the argument. Others have been marginalized by the changing needs of believers as history has moved on. 
but they still exist and are available for use if and when required. As Muslims in recent generations have settled outside the Muslim majority parts of the world, they are faced with environments and challenges which demand some quite serious responses. Often, the inherited mainstream views and practices provide limited satisfaction and sometimes they are outright dysfunctional. The characteristic of the immigration into Western Europe, which took off during the 1960s and 70s, was that the immigrants overwhelmingly came from the countryside, villages and small provincial towns. Their background was mostly agricultural, and the educational level tended to be poor, with a high rate of illiteracy, especially among women. In fact, this stage of the migration was, in, was but a minor dimension of the remarkable immigration from countryside to city, which was, and still is, taking place through the developed world. But Berlin, Birmingham and Brussels are different from Cairo, Karachi and Ankara. The mere move from village to city has driven changes which have found expression in economic and political, but also in religious terms. But the move to Europe, to European cities, represents also a move to a world in which religion, as such, was moving to the margins in the peculiarly European process of secularization. And what religion there was in the public space, whether implicit in culture and discourse, or explicit in institutionalized civic and state religion, was not Islam, but some form of Christianity. It was the process of family reunion which brought Islam into Europe. Before that, the mainly male single, mi single migrant workers had had little practi practical connection with their culture and religion. It was as if this was being taken care of by the family back home on their behalf. The arrival of wives and children was initially provoked by the closing of the gates of labour migration in Britain from 1962 and in mainland Europe in response to the recession sparked by the oil crisis of 72 to 74. With the family came the full panoply of cultural traditions, increasingly expressed in Islamic terms, especially around the encounters with Europe, European public services in connection with childbirth, women's health and children's education. Here was the motivation for local communities to establish places of worship and facilities for bringing children up in the basic tenets of Islam in so-called Quran schools. Communities often brought in their own imams according to their traditional expectations of an imam. So many of these were seriously undereducated and had no experience and few resources for providing guidance to their congregations in an environment which bore no resemblance to what they were used to. Soon Islamic movements and their organizations saw the needs and the opportunities. Coming from the countries of origin, it was often movements which had grown up in opposition to European colonial powers and to European cultural and education dominance that were best placed to join the migration. From the Indian subcontinent, it was movements such as Dilbund, Jamaat Islami, and Tabliya Jamaat, and from North Africa, movements which had grown out of the Muslim Brotherhood. In the case of the Turks, the situation was different. Here, there was a distinct rivalry between the movements which had emerged in opposition to the secular state, movements such as the Nursis and the Miligurish, on the one hand, and on the other, the structures sponsored by the Dianet, the government's religious affairs department. For many Muslims in those early phases, it was probably in their encounters with other Muslims from different backgrounds that the realization dawned that seeking refuge in Islam as a source of reassurance and identity in the face of all this strangeness was actually problematical. One of my first research students in Birmingham at the end of the 1970s reported an incident in a mosque where she had asked a group of men about Muslim expectations of burial. Quickly, the discussion degenerated into an internal argument about two different ways of burying a body, both of which were claiming authority in the Quran. It turned out that the men came from two distinct districts of Pakistan and each were seeking to explain their own custom in Islamic terms. The Quran has nothing to say about how to perform a burial. The whole complex of customs was in this way open to internal challenge. Muslims needed to find out more about their own faith tradition because of the new situation they found themselves in. In this process it was the younger people 
and especially the women, who had the strongest motivation to push ahead. They also increasingly had the personal experience and the intellectual skills learned as they grew through European school systems. Their own personal, uh, personal priorities challenged them to explore what was essential to being a Muslim, to seek for practices and ways of living which were functional in the European environment, and in the process to determine what of their parents' culture was non-essential. They entered into a process of stripping the essence of Islam of its local cultural accretions and reclothing it in ways which made sense in their new environment. The first public manifestations of this new phase hit the headlines in 1989, the year of the affairs when in January protests against Salman Rushdie's book The Satanic Verses spread in the streets of Britain. In September it was the turn of France when four girls were banned from a North Power secondary school for insisting on wearing headscarves. The British population census of 1981 had shown that the largest age sector of the population of Pakistani ethnic origins was those aged 6 to 15. This was the age group which at the end of the same decade was fast entering the employment market and in the process experiencing the widespread racial discrimination documented by much research conducted in university think tanks and the Commission for Racial Equality. These young people had been brought up with expectations of rights and public participation, inculcated both by their schooling and, notably, also by much of the Islamic local and national leadership. Their expectations were being disappointed, and here was a cause around which they could rally in protest. I personally heard from a number of mosque leaders of their astonishment at the demonstrations. Many, most of these young people, I was told, were not known to the mosques. Over the following years, other developments became points of mobilization of young people into an active identification with Islam. The wars arising out of the collapse of Yugoslavia were perceived by many as the first phase in an implicit long-term strategy of ridding Europe of its Muslim populations. Supplying emergency aid to the Muslims of Bosnia was a strong focus which for a time was, much more, was, was a much more successful activator of young Muslims than any mosque was. It provided the drive for the creation of what is now one of the large national British aid agencies, Islamic Relief. All this, all this took place in the context of an expanding international rhetoric about Islam, the new enemy. Following the end of the Cold War and the disintegration of the Soviet system. Samuel Huntington's clash of civilization offered substance to the rhetoric, a substance which was widely rejected, but which subsequent events appear to have made into a self-fulfilling <coughs> prophecy. The focus on terrorism, with increasing focus on Islamic versions, was gradually becoming an important driver of public debate and public policy. Already in 1992, the Dutch Internal Security Service was warning that domestic and international events were in danger of encouraging a process of radicalization among Muslims in the Netherlands. There was a widespread belief among British Muslims that the new anti-terrorist legislation enacted in response to the bombing of Omar by an IRA splinter group in 1998 was actually targeted primarily at Muslims. By this time, the initiative in Muslim organizations were beginning to move into the hands of a younger and better educated generation, one which acknowledged implicitly or explicitly their permanence, the permanence of their presence in Europe. Their links with the countries of origin remained significant, but these links increasingly had to share attention with other priorities, both domestic and international. In some quarters especially, where there were large concentrations of particular ethnic minorities, it had been possible to recreate elements of traditional community in one form or another. Twelve years ago, in an attempt to develop a typology of roots of integration, I suggested a process of collective isolation in which communities find protection in collective retrenchment. Elsewhere, there's been a process of weakening of inherited ethnic belonging, linked to a strengthening of identification with other developments and priorities shared with other Muslims. This is a process 
which can place young people into a relationship of conflict, both with their more traditional parents, as well as, as, well as with elements of the surrounding European society. At the same time, the extended family relations often continue, maintaining links with the countries of origin, including regular return visits. Emigration no longer means a permanent break with the original home, as it did when parents when people of my grandparents' generation moved from Denmark to North America in the 1920s. Through the ease of travel, large numbers of young Muslims get access to experiences of other ways of thinking about Islam and of being Muslim. Maintaining contacts with the family home or charitable or political engagement with regions of conflict can suggest options for a personal way forward through the conflicted space of identity formation. But it can be a dangerous path if the options, if the options suggested are among those on offer in regions subject to war or violent instability. In extreme cases, Visits to family in Pakistan or Algeria have been the route through which individuals have been seduced into violent radical movements. Despite all the headlines, however, radicalization is a small minority activity, although nonetheless dangerous for that. More common is the way in which so-called Salafi tendencies have attracted especially younger people. They could also be located in the group denoted collective isolation in the, in the typology mentioned previously. Except that the community which is isolating itself here is not an ethnic, but one of a much more voluntary character. It's a community of shared theological commitment rather than one of shared cultural heritage. Salafism as a term has its origins in the concept of the Salaf, namely the Muslims of the time of the Prophet and immediately after, the founder generation. The term was resurrected in the late 19th century by early reformers and is particularly associated with Muhammad Abdul, the Egyptian scholar who became the first reforming rector of Al Azhar University. But more recently, it's come to be associated more closely with more puritanical forms of Islam, often identified with the Wahhabi tendencies for Saudi Arabia. The tendency, at least as it manifests itself in Europe, focuses on study of Quran and Hadith particularly encourages pious and personal correct behavior, emphasizing the Prophet as a model to be emulated. Salafi mosques and study groups are attractive because they offer a supportive environment for young people who, theologically self-taught, have become disenchanted with their parents' customs while finding insecurity and rejection in wider European society. They are often particularly attractive to young families who fear for their children's upbringing in an environment which seems to lack coherent values and authority. Because of the way they dress, they often become the focus of, of attention when there is a terrorist scare. But all the evidence suggests that the European Salafi groups abjure violence. In this they have something in common with the well-known and in many quarters notorious party of liberation, Hezbi Tahrir, which otherwise bears little resemblance to the Salafi. The problem with both of these as well as, as well as with other similar tendencies, is that they have a strong focus on what they see as the injustices of the politics of the Muslim world. It is therefore not surprising that they can function as feeder routes into the more radical activist groupings and occasionally slip over the line into violent activism. On the other hand, the process of political engagement, which may arise out of a growing identification with headline issues in the Muslim world, can play an important integrated role when the issue in question is one which has activated broader sections of society as a whole. One prime example of this in both the United States and in Europe is the movement opposing the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Here there's been a cause where often very angry Muslims have found common ground and shared in a common political activity with a wide spectrum of trends in society as a whole. Here, they have discovered a route of integration and inclusion in the European space under the heading of the anti-war movement. I would suggest that similarly, the controversies provoked by the Muhammad cartoons in Yunnan's Boston a couple of years ago have encouraged an increase in cross-cultural and cross-religious activities in Denmark. This crisis may thus in the future also come to be seen 
as ultimately an integrated event. Throughout these various developments, Muslims have been getting increasingly organised with the purpose of making an impact on the political processes in the societies in which they live. Participation in the public space has become an essential tool of integration, and the very process of participation requires the development of mechanisms and forms of expression which can persuade the target audience, be it local or central government, or various civil society institutions. Equally, the process of participation itself favours those trends within the Muslim communities which wish to move away from attitudes to, for example, social and human relations which are commonly identified with traditional Islam and to which the anti-Islam anti polemicists like to devote their undivided attention. Just under a year ago, we experienced a particularly absurd, or two years ago now, uh, we experienced a particularly absurd example of this process when a German judge notoriously refused to grant a woman of Moroccan origin a divorce on the grounds that the Quran permitted her husband to beat his wife, so she had to live with him. In the uproar that followed, the decision was presented as proof of the medieval character of Islam, although it was a German judge who delivered the decision. Apparently, it was of no importance in the polemic that not only was the judge suspended and the case retried to the advantage of the wife, but more interestingly, more interestingly from my point of view, German and Austrian Muslim organizations also vehemently condemned the judgment. The Zentralheit Deutsche Muslim not only insisted that intramarital violence was grounds for divorce also in the Muslim world, but even stated that, the quote, and I quote, the judge should have made a decision based on the German constitution, not on the Quran, which, it went on to stress, could not in any case be interpreted in the way it had been by the judge. The Islamische Gemeinschaft in Österreich issued an official statement condemning the judgment based on a reference to both the Quran and the prophetic Sunnah. Such attitudes in individual cases are reflected in a number of attempts to draw up more general statements of principle. When the Interfaith Network in the United Kingdom, an organization which has become a significant link between the faith communities and government, in 1991, published a statement on interreligious relations in Britain, it was intended as a set of principles to guide the attitudes and behavior of the various religions towards each other and towards society as a whole. The statement was approved unanimously by the membership, which included major national Muslim organizations, including some of those which had been active in the campaign against the, the Satanic Verses and were later to form the Muslim Council of Britain. Three years later, the Paris Grand Mosque in the affirmed a commitment to a France based on a common citizenship, founded on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, and on Republican values. This was a more political document, reflecting the tensions in the wake of the Headscarves affair, and at the time it was widely criticised by other French Muslim organisations. However, later developments have, if anything, served to confirm its relevance. The first phase of such, phase of such statements was motivated especially by the suspicions raised by the affairs of 1989 and 90 regarding the ability of Muslims to integrate successfully, what a German scholar a decade before had called the question of Muslims' integrationsfähigkeit. The more recent phase has been clearly been driven by the need to respond to the events of the 11th of September 2001 and the increased impact of security considerations on attitudes to Islam and Muslims. Already in February 2002, the Zentral Art Deutsche Muslime issued an Islamic charter which affirmed that Muslims living in the West should abide by the legal order guaranteed by the Constitution that there was no contradiction between Islamic principles and human rights principles, and that Muslims must develop a European identity. In Britain, the 1990s had witnessed contested developments of national federations of Muslim organisations, among which the Muslim Council of Britain for a time was privileged by the government, but opposed by a network of organisations and individuals with strong commitments particularly against the Middle East policies of the United Kingdom. But the aggravated security environment after the London terrorist attacks of 7 July 2005 added pressure on the various groups 
develop some kind of common move towards common standards. The pressure was heightened by a growing complaint from young people, especially women, that mosques tend to be run by small cliques of men. In late June 2006, the outcome was a joint initiative by four national Muslim organizations, including for the first time a Shiite organization, the al Khoury Foundation, to establish the mosques and imams national advisory board. The board was launched with a draft constitution and a draft set of standards, which included a requirement that member bodies should have transparent structures and finances, should have agreed policies on equality of opportunity, health and safety, and child protection. Member mosques are expected to promote civil res civic responsibility of Muslims in wider society, encourage local interfaith activity and opposed forced marriage, and combat the use of violence and harassment within marriage. Most recently, in June 2008, the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, representing around 400 Muslim groupings, launched the Muslims in Europe Charter Project. This project calls for, among other things, equality of the sexes, respect for family, human rights, social justice and dialogue, in the context of an affirmation of harmony between Islam and the principles of democracy. Such statements arise in a given political context and are often part of a response to particular political challenges. For that reason, they are easy to dismiss as being opportunist or manipulative. But they reflect some deeper discussions which are taking place among European Muslims. Discussions which are extremely interesting indications of a possible convergence of thinking between the immigrant Islam of Western Europe and the long since integrated Islam of Southeastern Europe. These discussions focus on the nature and role of the Islamic Sharia, and I'll just take two examples. In Sarajevo, Professor Fikret Kalajic talks on the exploration of the norms of the Sharia, stating that historically there's a detailed experience of the strictly legal aspects of the Sharia, functioning in partnership with legal rules and norms developed by government. In the Ottoman Empire, a system known as Qanun <coughs> uh, was run parallel to that of the Islamic law. The basic criterion for the legitimacy of such a practice is the welfare of the community in general, and we're back to this concept of muscle harm. Reviewing the spread of secular government in the 20th century and then the revival of interest in Sharia among Muslims in the last generation, he reflects on the situation of Muslims in secular states, such as his own Bosnia, and in minority situations. He considers Sharia, in its traditionally developed form, to consist of religious, ethical, and legal norms. As legal norms, the Sharia depends on the existence of an Islamic state. In a secular state, as in a minority situation, the Sharia can function for Muslims individually and collectively as religious and ethical. Such an approach is echoed in some quarters among Muslim thinkers in France. Tariq Ubru is Imam of the main mosque in Bordeaux and a leading figure in the Union des Organisations Islamiques en France, which has its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood. He is active in a movement seeking to develop the Sharia for the minority, Fir la Pellier. His perception of minority is not primarily a quantity, but an acknowledgement that the situation is, in Islamic terms, exceptional and therefore requires an exceptional approach, accepting that the situation of being a minority in Europe is a permanent condition. Basing himself in the Islamic intellectual tradition, Ubru also reaches a conclusion which distinguishes the three, the three facets of Sharia, the religious, the ethical, and the legal, where the illegal, where the legal is essentially laid aside. Both these thinkers are part of a much larger network of Muslim intellectuals located both inside and outside the Muslim world, representing a wide spectrum of views and approaches to being Muslim in the modern world. For some, the drive is to be found in the theoretical tradition, the traditional disciplines of the Islamic state. For others, in the daily requirements of social practices of the communities they work with and are part of. To revert to my starting point, the core dimension of what we engaged in is the fact of rapid and, and complex change. This must have an impact 
on how we understand and interpret what we, what we record and engage with. The academic researcher obviously focuses on what has been and what is. After all, that's where our data are to be found. Ironically, the polemicist does the same, but in a more blatantly selective manner and with an, with an agenda focused on selected current political and religious priorities. But I'd suggest that the scholar of contemporary Islam needs also to, focus, needs also to include a focus on potential. This is not the same as prediction, although I'm sure we shall often be asked to predict. It's rather an understanding of the possibilities that the intellectual tradition has accumulated and an acknowledgement that the social, economic, cultural and political changes of our time influence and will continue to influence the intellectual roots which Muslim thinkers globally and particularly in Europe are developing and will continue to develop. It's also an acknowledgement that whether we like it or not, Western scholars of Islam are participants in this process. Thank you very much.